And we are live. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the stream. I hope you're all doing well. I see that Ikaos is already there. Uh, so, I mean, as a, as a Danish, I'm pretty sure that you were looking forward to this interview tonight. So happy, uh, happy to have you here. Uh, and happy to have you here tonight for a new interview with a member of the European Parliament. So tonight, uh, we will discuss with uh, Danish MEP Margaret Oken from the Greens Group, uh, so on the left side uh, of politics. She is 70, 76 and has been an MEP since 2004. So she's on a fourth mandate. She sits currently in the Committee on Environment, Public Health and Food Safety and the Committee on Petitions. And she's substitute member in no co other committee, so that's rather unusual, but that means that she can focus on the, on the main committees. So, as usual, uh, before we start our conversation, I remind, remind the house rules for anyone who is new with us tonight. So, Mrs. Oaken, our guest, will be with us for about an hour. After that, she will enjoy go uh, go out and enjoy the rest of the evening and i'll keep streaming for you for about half an hour to discuss uh, what you thought of the interview my own interpretation of things perhaps provide a few additional explanations that sort of things you know how it works uh, as usual i've prepared my own question for mrs Alken and i collected questions from discord and reddit you can also ask your question directly via the chat i will keep an eye on it and uh, i will pick among your suggestions so feel free to participate and react, but as usual, don't spam and stay civil. The goal of this MEP interview is for you to understand better what is the job of an MEP. Uh, right now, who is Mrs. Auken, her priorities and maybe some, some of her opinion on general EU political questions. So I invite a variety of MEPs over here so that they may share their opinion, whether you agree with them or not. That's not the, not the point. The point being for you to see this diversity and build your own opinion while I'm here to facilitate the discussion uh, without taking a stand. So we will not go deep into policy discussions and we will not touch upon national politics unless it is relevant to EU politics. So keep that in mind when you ask your questions. So without further ado, let's do this. So good afternoon and welcome to you, Mrs. Oken, Margaret Oken. Uh, thank, thank you again you. Uh, for accepting to do this interview on my channel. Uh, so you heard me explain it to our viewers. The goal of tonight is to put faces on, on the European Union and help people understand better what's happening in Brussels. So tonight we'll get to know you better and on the, try to understand what you actually do and think about the EU. So perhaps to start off the discussion, uh, could you briefly introduce yourself uh, to the audience and we'll pick up from there. Yeah, well, and my name is Margrethe Augen. As I said, I've been, I'm quite old, but, you know, keeping up. Uh, the <laughs> grandmother of eight children, so I still have to use all forces I can to safeguard their world. I have been doing environmental policy since the mid-70s, for nature and so on. I was many years in the Danish parliament before I was elected to European parliament. And uh, also, in a little addition, I was uh, many, many years uh, a pastor in the Danish church. Of course, it's a very reduced time, but it's a very strong part of my identity. And uh, I've been f first and foremost working with the with, uh, environment, nature, but also very much with uh, international affairs, with legal affairs. That's a very important part for me. And then I've been doing Palestine for a very long time. And I'm the vice uh, president of the uh, European Parliament's delegation to Palestine. Just to tell you that I also have this strong uh, uh, work uh, on my on my agenda the whole time but that is very brief who i am okay well thank you and uh, in, in, uh, as, as you mentioned you, uh, you've had already a rich career and you haven't started politics uh, with the european parliament i mean over over the past interviews we've seen actually quite a, a few brand new meps who were in a way starting politics with the uh, with the MEP mandate but uh, uh, that's not your case and uh, perhaps just to, to, to finish on your background so you said you've been in your national parliament for, for, for quite some years before going to the European parliament so uh, how did it feel to, to change from Danish parliament to the European parliament? Well I was originally uh, very reluctant to do it because you know I say well I might be a, a, a world citizen as cosmopolitan, but I am it here in Copenhagen. And I'm very much, much linked to Copenhagen. I like Danish politics. 
Uh, so there were many reasons. I was one of those leading for, uh, persons to change my party into a, a pro-European party it used to be very strongly against. And uh, so that was also an, a, a, an obligation for me to then to take up the job when, it's, when we managed to make this uh, shift in the party. And then I have realized after I came to the European Parliament that it is, uh, well, it's quite exciting that you are sitting there coming from a small country and suddenly can influence what is going on and what's be the law in, you know, this big union with around 500 million people. And uh, I think, oh, I love having influence. Mm -hmm. So that's a very strong reason <laughs> why I feel very much engaged in the European, European politics. And I like very much that the European Parliament has a co-decision when we make laws. It's not only the governments, it's also us. And we are, as Parliament, you know, we are the only body within the EU institution who really represents all our citizens because we are generally elected. Governments normally only directly represent around half their population. And we feel a strong obligation for that too, that we have the citizens behind us. Okay, that's, in that's interesting. Um, as you mentioned, so you're, uh, in, as we all know uh, here, MEPs are often specialized. Uh, so you said you, met, you worked on quite a, a few different uh, uh, areas of work. Uh, you mentioned environment, you mentioned legal affairs. But today, what are the topics you are usually working on? Well, I, you know, me, you know, working in the Green Group means that we have a strong engagement in climate, of course, in biodiversity uh, in this year. But I myself, has by, by very much my focus with environment. In the environment, plastics. I'm doing a lot on plastic and try to stop the plastic pollution and find a safer way to, to deal with plastics. And that has been, you know, since 2015, 15 or 14, uh, strong in my agenda, well, even before. I'm uh, also doing a lot on within health, on, uh, on, uh, uh, yes, of course, Corona now. Uh, trying to work for having uh, left the uh, the uh, patents on vaccines, so we can got, get the whole world vaccinated. It should be possible. We have the, uh, a tiny minority behind us in asking the co Commission to to take care of that. I've been working with transparency within uh, within uh, from social industry solved also you know, secured a lot of things there. And uh, I could add now that I've also, because that's quite new for me, uh, really to, uh, I have found out that we can link the strong uh, fight for renewable energy with uh, nature yeah, regeneration. You know, just to tell you, it might even uh, uh, encourage you that if you play a, play, a place, uh, you know, uh, uh, wind turbines at the coastal, quite close to the coastal, in far the most uh, uh, occasions, you create nature at the same time because these uh, uh, these wind turbines create reefs, artificial reefs, which at least in Denmark is extremely needed. Uh, the seabed has been des destroyed by terrible trawl fishing and so on. Uh, but now we see where you have these uh, sea uh, wind turbines. Lots of mussels and life are coming there. Birds are loving it. Uh, you know, dolphins are loving it. And you create life and it's so needed. So if you are really aware of, of which, what a terrible situation, the sea and the seabed is, but we can, we can really do something if we combine renewable energy, wind turbines with uh, regeneration of nature. That's just to tell you a good story. Oh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's nice. Actually, that that provides me the the perfect uh, transition to to the first question I had from uh, uh, from Ikao, so uh, one of our Danish uh, uh, member of the audience. Uh, and it's a question we we've asked already a, a few times to other MEPs who work on uh, on energy issues. So the question is uh, between the wind energy, hydro energy, solar, nuclear. Where should Europe invest in energy? Why and why not? They should invest a lot in. Uh, renewables and they should do it very fast because we don't have much time. Whatever you think about nuclear, I'm very reluctant, which is known. But I can say even if it was safe, even if we have solved 
the waste which we haven't. Uh, then it will take far too long a time. It's far, far too costly. It's extremely expensive. And we are in a hurry. So we should invest so much in uh, wind, uh, wind energy, in solar energy. We can do a lot there. Also, you know, from, from the earth and uh, uh, all these, uh, you know, well-known technologies, but also in new technologies where we can uh, can create uh, uh, natural gas again from from waste, from methane, and so on. And uh, that should be done as fast as possible because we are really in a hurry. And uh, and that is, we don't have time for. See, we will sit here down backwards and wait for something mysterious, fantastic will show. And of course, at the same time. Uh, make lots of research uh, and development, uh, and this uh, both things should be done. But you know, don't don't uh, mistake yourself. We are so much in a hurry, and we have just a few years now to 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 change the pattern. And it, of course, the craziest thing is we have known this here for for um, 30, 40 years, and I think 30 years. The first report from the uh, from the uh, UN climate panel came in. You know, the IPCC mm -hmm. came in July in 1990, and uh, I wrote something about it already at that time. And everything was, you know, basically known. And you know, people are just sitting waiting there for having we a smart fix, something we can do. It doesn't work. We have to really go into this here. Have to create a, a more healthy uh, agriculture. It's not healthy yet. They have to make a transportation where, where, where the link between bicycles and uh, collective transport should be much more improved than it is now. We should do a lot there. We should insulate our houses, which is not done. If you are in Brussels, you will see that you are, when you are heating your apartment, you are heating half Brussels because mm -hmm. the insulation sure. is so bad. So a lot to be done there and quickly. Okay. Oh, well, interesting. Uh Thank you for that. So uh, switching to more health uh, question, I mean, because of course the pandemic uh, creates a lot of interest in, in these things. Uh, and the question again from, from the audience uh, it was what, what should we do to prepare for the next pandemic? So putting, uh, putting COVID aside, what is, is the current strategy that relies on almost entirely private pharma enterprise vaccine sufficient? Should we learn from other zero-based strategy in the Southwest Pacific? What should we do to prepare? Yeah, I think that, uh, uh, of course, a lot of things are un unknown. There's a risk that uh, the way, and these things here in the link, you know, with too little space for nature, too little space for animals. Within the industrial animal production, you have too many animals, pigs in Denmark, critically, living far too many, far too close. And the risk of having having viruses coming from the, the you know the so-called zoonosis is really there, and uh, there that we have to bear in mind and do what we can as early as possible, and of course then prepare for how can we cooperate better and how can we make the whole pharmaceutical industry, uh, system more transparent because it costs a hell of a lot of money, and it's. Uh, it's very bad that we don't know how our money is spent, how we can make sure that the results of clinical trials and so on and so forth are transparent. It is not now in the law, but industry are, yeah, is it, uh, uh, opposing this transparency, which is in the law in Europe. And then, of course, find out lots of common research. And we might even uh, be more insisting of having of having a public research, public pro uh, production, because we already spent, you know, pharmaceutical industries get between 70 to 90% of their costs beforehand covered from the public funding, uh, you know, uh, education, researchers, and so on and so forth. We could do a lot and uh, be much more eager to insist of having this as common goods. Just to re remind you, when uh, you might know the story about when the, the vaccine against uh, polio, uh, which was a big, uh, mm -hmm. or not a, almost a pandemic in, in my childhood. Uh, and then when the, the guy who invented the vaccine against polio and was asked, shouldn't he have a patent? He said, no, I have my good salary, but this is a gift to humanity. And this uh, whole approach should be much more in focus again, because we cannot afford uh, financing 
enormous profits uh, to stakeholders in the pharmaceutical industry in the way we do it now. We must also be more uh, cautious about making sure that this year is for the public good, for humanity, and not just for profit for stakeholders. And beyond uh, the, 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 the way of approaching the, the, so the industry uh, that should be more, uh, uh, I don't want to say uh, empathetic, but uh, towards common good, as you, as you, as you uh, put it, uh, what should the EU, what should be done at, by the EU and internationally, by, uh, by the institution beyond the private sector? I, th I think that, uh, you know, the better cooperation, early warnings, sharing uh, knowledge is sharing uh, the uh, demands for, for transparency, make sure that contracts we make uh, are uh, safe, make sure that we have the knowledge also about how it results of clinical trials. And uh, that's, you know, for, for the part of vaccines and industry. And then we might really look into what has fueled the pandemic, the way people are interacting, the way, uh, the way they're living together. You know, One of the good things in Denmark, which has happened when we managed quite, a, quite, 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 quite well uh, to not to get uh, totally uh, kicked down by this pandemic was <laughs> very basic, learn people to wash their hands. Uh, I think that uh, probably is one of the most best things was done in this pandemic, that uh, children, uh, everybody really got accustomed to always, always, also again and again, wash your hands because lots of contamination is coming this way. And it's quite remarkable that uh, normally, annually, around in Denmark, uh, more than a thousand people are dying from influence, from the flu, mm -hmm. even if they have been vaccinated. Uh, last year, 2020, this year, you know, it has been reduced, <laughs> reduced dramatically. And it's not so much because of the, uh, you know, the mouse, what you call it, the uh, community uh, 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 masks, not so much by by uh, uh, all these other things, but as so much by having a little bit distance to each other, clean your hands. And uh, I think it's very basic, but I think it helps a lot if you have that kind of hygiene uh, in your daily life and mm -hmm. you don't need to get hysterical because of that. Uh, and out of curiosity, how, how was the, the what were the, the, the lockdown rules in Denmark? Was, was there a hard lockdown? Was it more relaxed? How, how did, it, uh, did it happen? Well, probably I think the lockdown was very expensive for Denmark. And I was especially sorry for young people who lost uh, schools, uh, folk high schools and what they did. And that was really a pain because I rem remember these years myself when you were 15, 16, 17, 18, how important these years are. And I really felt sorry. I saw it with my grandchildren. And, and uh, uh, I think that, uh, that they might have paid a too high price. And it also, you know, we used a lot of money to compensate, uh, you know, restaurants, uh, industries, uh, tourism and so on. And, some of it but i think it was good that we managed to do that i'm just wondering uh, if it continues if we are really able to pay the bill for that but it was a good idea probably the lockdown was a little bit too uh, too tough uh, i mean i think in the long run it'd be interesting to compare, compare denmark to for instance sweden they have many more uh, uh, fatalities you know but it was especially uh, in the uh, in the nurseries and uh, among the pensionists. And there might be that we could compare, uh, com uh, combine a better survey of how we do this without without leaving the, uh, the old people in uh, insulation, because that's also very, very sad when you do that. And uh, But having a better awareness this than they had in Sweden. But also look into, could we keep much more of the society working because the price has been social economically very high mm -hmm. of course okay well that, that that's interesting to to hear the different approaches because especially in the nordic country where we are but further north we know that there have been very different uh, approaches yes. so in sweden etc so it's, it's always interesting and we, to... need, and we need to really to look into the figures to look into what what did what country do wrong what did they do good mm. because we can learn from that if we want to learn from each other Indeed. Um, moving away completely uh, out of uh, health issues, uh, 
something that is uh, again more about uh, green policy so i had a question from from reddit uh, about someone who lives in the uk actually and has been following the exit of the uk from the eu so of course he he said uh, the person is sad about it but uh he was worrying about how the uk and the eu could continue to work together on environmental issues what are the values which the eu and the uk will continue to share to progress on green policies Oh, I think it's difficult because e if it, it, because the UK has really distance. I, I you know I lost a lot of my friends, and we had them in the Green Group. We had a fantastic delegation from Scotland, from 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 England, from Wales, and we miss them so much. And uh, the problem is really that uh, Boris Johnson and uh, well the majority didn't want to have any arrangements which could oblige them to the EU laws and that has made it very difficult because we cannot undermine the EU legal system uh, just to facilitate a better cooperation with the uh, with uh, with UK and uh, just one thing I did just shout a message to my husband just one thing <laughs> Go ahead. that's what we call les alias du direct in French Okay, just sorry. Yeah, no just problem. To, yeah, okay, to just into my husband. But uh, I think that uh, I really hope that the, 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 the British will keep up the spirit and do their best and try to, as much as they can, if we can still share knowledge, we can uh, 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 experiences and so on and so forth. And then I really hope that one day, not too far out, that they will come home again. We we miss them, and I know it was mostly uh, old people who voted no uh, to you know, leave, and so many young people want to remain in the in the. And I still hope, you know, it's legal to find new ways, and also to find out that wasn't smart. Mm -hmm. That's still my naive hope. Mm. I I see what you I see what you mean. I, I mean, and a lot of people hope for the UK to come back. Some yes. point in the future, and then the question yeah. is how long? Come home, I said, come <laughs> home. <laughs> but st still on this question of the UK, so even if the, the, uh, the UK diver uh, decided to diverge quite significantly from uh, from the EU, uh, the Prime Minister, so uh, Boris Johnson, also likes to, uh, to to, to advertise himself as very much in favor of fighting climate, uh, the climate crisis. Uh, he's, been, he's been doing uh, quite a lot to try to, to pitch himself as the partner of the of the US on the on this. So, do you think it's something genuine or there's it's just politics? Yes, I no, I don't know. <laughs> politics is not necessarily so bad, but uh, is it just greenwashing? Mm. I don't know. I might, you know, if, that's also when you have lost contact. I cannot really follow. Uh, 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 closely what's going on uh, and uh, uh, I might fear that uh, the economic situation you know the immediate economic situation in in the in the UK will be so so uh, vulnerable after this brexit that uh, it will be very difficult to have a more long-sighted uh, initiatives that's my fear but uh, hopefully I'm wrong there and then they are able to also to uh, to uh, to uh, have the same uh, same laws, of, uh, even better, but perhaps in the UK, because of course UK is still whatever member of the EU and not they are part of the uh, you know our common community. Mm. And if they are polluting the world, it's very bad. If they are contributing to solving the problem, it's a it's a gift to all of us. So I really hope that. And uh, since we've been talking about the UK and uh, to the break about the Brexit, I, I have little Miss Derry in chat who is asking uh, that she has heard in uh, in that in Denmark there's also some dis there has been some discussion about a Den a DK exit. So is it only high level discussion or is it just some specific political parties? Absolutely, it's nonsense. I'd say, you know, we, you might hear it here and there, but it's it's much it's a much lower demand than it used to be just a few years ago, and uh, you know now it's it's almost have totally left the center west sorry the center left sorry the center left in the parliament it's a, the right wingers very nationalistic and they have have not at all presented some uh, attractive models for how this could be done uh, in in some uh, decent way and i think it can be if it really happened it would be 
a disaster for for Denmark because uh, you know we are just we are just a small country and uh, we would be so much in in uh, in the in the pocket in the hands the pocket of big powers would be it politically or industrial and uh, we have will have no say uh, because when we are alone you are alone yeah and uh, even germany will be uh, in troubles in a few years you know i think it's a very important no sorry famous speech from from uh, uh, the former the former chancellor uh, 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 in our trader uh, yeah okay comes but where he was reminding uh, germany that in the 2050 uh, if even germany will only count its inhabitants in in few percents mm. of the global uh, of the global population so even germany cannot do without being together and, and so the fact that uh, the, the this dk exit uh, has been has been less prominent. Is it a consequence of Brexit or is it people that became pro-European? No. What happened? <laughs> no, no. I think that Brexit learned uh, uh, the big majority of those who were in favor of a, a, a Denmark leaving the EU, which never had been, not never, but it has, it's a long time since it was a majority. It hasn't been a majority. And now it's really a minority. And I think even in this minority, uh, the the, the, the vast part of them saw how how expensive and how bad it was uh, for you for the UK to leave the EU. So the voices calling for that are very very, you know, uh, I wouldn't call them low because they are shouting, but very few people are listening to them as if it was uh, important. Okay, the chancellor's name was Helmut Schmidt. Ah yes, and okay. it, uh, yes, and the and the speech was in 2011 to SPD and I would recommend everybody to go in. It takes an hour, the old man in a wheelchair <laughs> uh, delivering a fantastic speech in German, sorry, but it's probably it's, it's translated in other languages. But go in and look into it and you'll find what a man. And that was in 2011 to the SPD, you know, the Social Democratic yes. Party in Germany, their Congress. And I mean, even if the uh, so the, this DK exit kind of thing is became uh, became uh, quite low and a, a, a small minority, as you say, uh, Denmark historically has always had more cautious approach to the EU than others. Uh, there has been opt out and something. So, how do you explain yes. this suspicion towards the yeah, EU? Yeah, well, I would put it like you know, yeah, it has been all over, but we had this no to the Maastricht Treaty uh, in two thousand. Uh, sorry, in ninety two. It was very discreet, zero point something. And at that time, there was a big campaign and we were against the union. You know, the union was at all uh, a beast. It was a threat. And our prime minister who advocated, he said, well, the uh, the uh, union is stand, stone dead, which was, of course, some, some nonsense. And you have this reluctance. My party and myself was, even at that time, uh, yeah, well, I wouldn't say yes against, but we saw this year is not working. And then we, we made uh, this agreement and in a way Denmark saved the EU because they could continue, uh, uh, you know, with the cooperation, with what we, we made our uh, four up at that time. And now one of them is now in the treaty. It's one of the European citizenship. It's not uh, actual any longer. And at that time, it was a good idea because it was a good message and it could be done like that. Now, I think it's really an obstacle to our work. We are just outside. You know, it, it, this idea that the little brave country, the Vikings up there, they are out on their own, they are so fantastic. No, they're just gone. And <laughs> I've seen it. And I think that is, I hope so much we could get rid of them so we can come back and get influence. Because we are still under the... And, you know, if you look into the to the uh, to the currency, to the euro, the Danish uh, the Danish currency corn is following the mm -hmm. euro up and down. Sometimes I say we have almost a Norwegian system here. We are in within everything except decision making. But, I don't find that sexy. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you said that back then uh, yourself and your party you were uh, cautious about you. What what and now you are much more. Pro EU, I mean, from what you're saying, what changed? Yes. What made you change what your mind? 
yeah, well, I was at that time already when, you know, I joined my party back in 72 after the referendum, strongly depressed. And you know, very sure you might remember in the 70s, very little happened, you know, if you're young enough, old enough, very little happened in the EU in the 70s. And then in the 80s, you have uh, the law. And he started to find out we have to move here. And then he made, you know, the single markets and so on. And I myself, uh, I didn't really, uh, I was active in politics from the early 70s, but not for the EU case. It was much more the fight against the nuclear power and the fight in favor of nature and uh, and the environment. And I would, uh, and then my, when I was elected to parliament in 79, uh, and uh, uh, do, was doing a lot of international uh, environmental politics and realized, you know, a little bit, it's not so clever that we are not part of the Green Left uh, uh, fight here together with the others. So I myself changed my mind during the 80s. And we have some other leading forces in, in the party who had the same uh, the same journey as, as, as I had. And uh, when we came to, at the end of the 80s, I was de facto saying we have to change our politics. I voted against the Maastricht because it was so much in the, the habits, almost in the genes. Uh, but my argument at that time was that that the uh, that the Maastricht Treaty didn't really uh, take into consideration what has ha- happened with the fall of the wall and you know the East Central Eastern Europe. Mm-hmm. So I still argued for that. But when we came to the when we had the made an agreement, which is called the Edinburgh Agreement in Danish context, I was strongly uh, uh, campaigning for it. And since then, much and I won't even use the term being pro-EU because I am, of course, pro-democracy. No, it's being pro-influence. And uh, and I would call uh, my party now, and now I have big support from the whole party. Yeah, well, very few probably, probably still remain in the old uh, no position. But, you know, if a vast majority... And we are EU engaged, and we probably, I'm close to say, we are probably the most EU engaged party in the Danish parliament now. Because we have also our relations, and we're much more involved in European party politics and the other parties in the European Green Party uh, and so on. So, you know, we see it in so many uh, aspects, and we also call, of course, that's all the parties who do that too, call for European solutions on the asylum refugees issues, European solutions uh, on energy, on environment, uh, European solutions on, well, I had my plastic issue and so on. And we can only do this here if we do this together. Mm -hmm. And uh, since you mentioned like that uh, currently uh, uh, your party is the most uh, European engaged uh, compared to other parties in Denmark, so yeah, I won't learn you anything but uh, uh, when we're talking about uh, Danish politicians uh, the superstar is Commissioner Margaret Vestager uh, so as a Danish uh, who's not from the same political party uh, as a, how do you see Margaret Vestager? Well I, I like her personally I've known her for many many years I don't think she's a leading force when it comes to environment uh, uh, climate and so on she's much more in the economic uh, mm-hmm, sphere of course and that has, uh, and she is there a uh, center right winger, no doubt. And uh, uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit, as you can hear, a little bit skeptical. I like her personal, and I think she's doing a, a good work. But when we have this real fight, how we move uh, uh, Europe, uh, she will be, and she can be very strong when we go against tax evasion, and this is good. When we go against all this here, which is also a very important battle. Uh, and I know she's in favor of having a common asylum policies, but it's not, a, it, and it has never been, or not when she was in the Danish parliament either, a main battlefield for her as have, having been environment. You know, she was in part of the, uh, if you might remember in the previous uh, uh, commission, and it's still there with uh, Juncker, where yep. they talked about small things, big things, you know, big and big things, small and small things. And they consider environment to be small things, as she did as well. And Timmermans, who is now really at the other side, at that time, he couldn't even spell environment. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, that, that makes things a bit awkward indeed. Um, yeah. and, and speaking uh, speaking of Mrs. Vestager, uh, I have Blas in the, in, the, uh, in the chat asking something in a way related to her, in the sense that he's asking you about your opinion about the, the recent news that Denmark has been helping the US spying on other European countries, so Germany and France, and back then Vestager was in government. Yes, well, I think that uh, you might remember uh, eight years ago, uh, Snowden yes. reveals that that was going on. And uh, I think that uh, so many people have known this here and so many people ha haven't done really anything. And the good advice is from Snowden, don't ever, never allow that you give up having your private life. And you might think it doesn't matter you, but imagine what you're doing for everybody else. And I think his uh, his battle was so important. He's one of my one of my heroes. You know, I have him to uh, Greta Thunberg and all these young people. And uh, uh, and I think that we haven't yet taken it serious how much surveillance will uh, you know limit our freedom, limit our how you develop the 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 the, the, uh, the vital society and. Uh, uh, and this going on, you know, lots of, of uh, spying is, has always happened, also among friends. It's not a surprise to me. I've been doing security policy, also, especially back in the 80s, and I'm not surprised. But uh, I think we should be much more careful also when we go into the whole uh, digital uh, society, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, all these things here. We should be very careful about sharing data and sharing uh, uh, informations. I want the open society, but I also want so much to care about people's uh, right to privacy, to have right to be themselves, and not have everybody to to looking into where are you, what are you, what are you saying, what are you doing. It'll be a hell. Okay, interesting. Um, and the final question uh, about Denmark, and then we we move on away from Denmark. Uh, I, I promise. Uh, and that's what we've been talking about uh, before we actually started the, the the stream. Could you a bit explain to 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 the audience uh, why the Nordic countries, and in your case De Denmark, uh, has been a bit cautious about the entire debate about the European minimum wage uh, that is meeting a lot of resistance. Yeah, and that is absolutely a tricky issue, and we have it so much in 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 the green group. And my Danish colleague Kia, uh, she's in fact the uh, the coordinator on on uh, this whole labor issue, and she's really I think she's doing a very good job to try to explain to both sides what is the dilemma. And briefly, the dilemma is that in we have in the Nordic country a very special labor market, so much based on ha having strong unions, high degree of organi uh, uh, organized members there, and the unions are taking their part responsibility. They have been partners with uh, equal partners with the employers, and they have, uh, you know, really solved a lot of, uh, you know, uh, you could put it. Uh, obstacles and uh, they have you know this system is also based at the union negotiate working conditions salaries and so on and so forth it's not the state uh, who does that and this system is is, is is absolutely very attractive but it's based on two things and one of them is that you have a very high degree of organization which is not the case outside the Nordic countries absolutely not you have seven, eight, ten percent organized, that's it. Mm -hmm. Which means you cannot have uh, this, uh, and most of this union you can see it very clearly, for instance, in France, where you just, they are organizing but it's only a part of the public sector, and it's uh, it's uh, transport, it's uh, the, the railways, and they are taking care of their own privileges, not looking into the unemployed, not looking into the whole place in the society. And so it's really, a, it's, it's a preacher thing that we have this union. But what they fear is that you have, if you have a law, uh, a law uh, based uh, minimum wage, then it will undermine our system because you, then you don't need to put much uh, power and force into the negotiation system. And then people can risk to leave the unions and you will weaken the union and we'll see it from many places. So they are strongly opposing that you have a a, a, a you know a basic uh, uh, 
uh, you know, a, a, you, uh, a mini, mi, yeah, minimum, minimum wage. wage. Yes. And At the other hand, then you have so many working poor in Europe. You have uh, also in German. You have people who cannot even survive with two jobs. You have all these pre uh, precautionary, uh, precarious workers, uh, platform workers. You have a heavy amount of problems. And I'm strongly in favor that we do our best to... Oh, we lost the video. To, yes, I'm just, it was just, I have to move in to have a better, uh, you know, my, 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 just a moment. Just yeah, a moment. No I'll sit. I will just sit and find out how to, to make the, uh, my, my, my charger a little bit better here. <laughs> so I, I will sit in here and I will find my charger and it's here. So we won't, if we won't risk that this here happens again. Like this here. Okay. Sorry. No yes, problem. I know I'm inside. No, I'm inside. You can see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. But let's continue. And I think the problem is really I I don't know how to solve this here. We can and we have done it. And I think we also got good guarantees that uh, that uh, the EU will absolutely respect the Nordic model and won't intervene and insist on having these. Uh, 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 you know, uh, law fixed minimum wages. But what they say in Denmark is, what we will risk that people who have very low salaries, if they are outside the uh, Danish systems, and we have areas within agriculture, restaurants, uh, cleaning service, hotels, uh, building, you know, if, if several areas are not covered by this year. And if then people come and say, what we have in the EU is a right to have a minimum wage. And we will take Denmark to court if they don't do. And of course, we can get all the guarantees we we, uh, we wish that this will not happen. Uh, and, there, uh, and I think it is enough. I think we should support minimum wages and, and really accept that we have the guarantee to keep up our own system. But I can hear in Denmark that they really fear that this will not be enough. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, so that's, that's a, a problem. Yeah, well, that's a that's a that's a, diffi a difficult uh, issue indeed yeah. because, yeah. I mean, like you said, uh, the the structure of the of the labor market is so so different in the Nordic countries than in the rest of the of Europe that creates a whole conundrum that you you very well described. Um, okay, but now moving away from the, from Denmark once and for all. Um, Let's let's dive a bit in, uh, into the fact. So you've been an MEP for more than fifteen years now. Uh, uh, I think you're by far the, the, the most experimented MEP we have, we've had so far on, on the channel. Uh, so let's take uh, let's take advantage of that. Uh, okay. How how did you see the job of MEP and the Parliament evolve uh, across these fifteen years? Has well, it gone better, can... worse? Well, in many in many aspects, better, of course. Uh, I think uh, uh, our big problem in, 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 among the parliamentarians is that our governments, you know, in the council, haven't really understood that the EU is not a an intergovernmental institution. It's something very different to that, and they still act as if they are the most important. They don't mm -hmm. really. Many of them haven't discovered that we have co decision. <laughs> I've heard ministers quite, you know, be so surprised that the parliament was not just allowed to make, uh, you know, hearing responses, but they have co-decision. And uh, what I really hope will happen, and it hasn't happened yet, is that we, uh, you know, a little side step, the, the European ombudsman, Emily O'Reilly, who is still our ombudsman, she wrote, uh, come with a very, very critical, strong report in May uh, 19, uh, sorry, 2018, on the lack of transparency in the council work. Yes. You know, Danish, you know, national parliamentarians, national press cannot follow what their own government is doing. And that means that the distance between the people and the EU decision system is very, very uh, problematic. And she says that according to the treaty, then European citizens uh, have the right to participate in the European democracy as close, as transparent as possible. And she insists, and I totally agree, that all meetings at council level, and it's not only when the ministers meet, 
but also when you have these working groups and so on. But we always have see the see agenda at forehand, see the minutes afterwards, see how we have written one uh, delegation position itself. So we can tell in Denmark, hey, hop, stop. Uh, Denmark voted against uh, uh, Apple to pay wa- uh, pay taxes and so on. It would be an outcry in Denmark if that was uh, if that was known. And if Danish media, or that goes for all other countries, the uh, national media and national parliamentarians could follow what their own government is doing, then I'll think we'll have a dramatic improvement of the European work. Because then they could see also, oh, hey, what's going on on both sides, in parliament and in in uh, in, uh, in, council, uh, yeah. in councils. And I, I wouldn't say it has improved in the time I've been there, but the, the, the awareness has improved. And also the awareness of, uh, of how needed this year is and how we have to change some of the institutions. We just passed a strengthening of our ombudsman it was a shock to me when I was first elected and I've been doing a legal policy in Denmark to also work with the ombudsman. And suddenly I saw how party politics was, you know, the big countries, big parties tried to, uh, to dominate the elections of the ombudsman. That was a shock to me. And now we have safeguarded that. But for instance, when we in the European Parliament appoint top uh, civil servants, secretary generals of this and that, it's clear and open, and nobody has shaped party political decided. That's a very bad, bad system in Europe. And uh, there, I think that our possibilities to discuss this are much better than it was when I came there. Although uh, it's you know it's not easy to do it, but of course you learn a lot by doing. Yeah. And now we have we have we have more staff, and that gives us well much more work personally because. Having three, four uh, young, very engaged people around you, you know, really create work. <laughs> so, for, so don't think you will, will be relieved from your work by this year. But uh, I think that uh, some of these things has improved, and they also have better, better, uh, uh, you know, a style about how how things are presented and so on. But still, there's really room for improvement. And there, I would first and foremost mention. Uh, the the lack of transparency in the council work because if that really uh, will happen to get get some transparency, you will see also that the democratic gap will be will disappear. Okay, interesting. Um, and again, uh, in fifteen in those fifteen years, what what would you consider uh, as your your biggest achievement? What is the thing you're most proud as an MEP? Yeah, well, you could say well, I have several things, but. Uh, I might I might mention well uh, that I was a front uh, front runner one of the front runners on the plastic pollution when we make the the law and how to really to uh, to uh, reduce to prevent pollution you know uh, now you don't know but you know number one in the hierarchy on waste and uh, uh, handling in Europe is uh, uh, prevention it's not reuse. Uh, 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 recycle, it's preventing. But the first law, uh, 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 and so that was uh, the law of plastic bags. Where we, uh, and now we have managed, I think, in, well, it's clearly in Denmark, but in many countries, you have put, you know, uh, 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 consumer prices on these bags, and the reduction is clear. We've done it also on single use plastics. We are far from a success. But the awareness, the awareness is there, and then I will mention. Secondly, that the what I, I think I mentioned before uh, within the transparency on clinical trials uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, where I was one of the uh, uh, also the driving forces to get full transparency uh, in the clinical trials results. Uh, and that we made a regulation, and a real regulation binding law back in 2013 14. It has been uh, postponed because of the removal of, of uh, not removal, sorry, the removal of, uh, of EMA, you know, the medicine agency and industry has opposed, you know, extremely heavy as they could. And I can add even to this when we had the negotiations 
between uh, you know on the free trade between US and the EU back in the 2014 15 now it's been stored but uh, mm. they were there it was so much about deregulation and uh, there they leaked a death list from a big industry in US which laws in Europe uh, US wants to get rid of and their big pharma had uh, identified what I call my law they wanted to get rid of that with transparency including advice I was really proud don't tell, don't tell that you cannot influence the situation when US big pharma want to get rid of what you have been an active force in, in obtaining and, but I could add one thing which has made the work, the work uh, more difficult than it was that the uh, uh, this uh, uh, you know very close nationalism has also increased in this time and we see with the whole lack of handling uh, the asylum problem and refugees that's really a a threat and it can even be a, a disaster to the European work because if you're not able to handle this here we will see some dramatic things can happen in Europe when we are turning the back to each other uh, we, we can handle the uh, uh, the problem with everybody agree, knows I wouldn't say agree on but they know this will not go away this will might might even as well and uh, nevertheless uh, they don't really engage in how to then to deal with it but if we deal with it together in Europe I'm I'm quite convinced that we can handle it too but if we don't it can be a, so much a threat to the solidarity within Europe between Europe and the rest of the world and it can harm uh, the humanity uh, for all of us and that will be I won't say it will be the end but it's a real threat to the European vision okay that's uh, that's interesting I mean and indeed yeah if the uh, the big US farmer wanted to get rid of some of something you worked on that means that you probably did something uh, uh, noticeable so I I can understand that, that you you would be proud of that uh, maybe uh, I see the time passing, so I will I will ask what has become now uh, a traditional last question. Uh, where do you stand on the old debate about a federal EU? Are you in favor? Are you against? Are you in between? I am probably very much in favor, uh, but uh, I think that uh, because we have, we need much more cooperation, we need a common foreign policy. There was a good uh, a proposal back with the discuss having a European treaty back uh, before the uh, before uh, the uh, Amsterdam and uh, uh, the Lisbon treaty where there was a proposal that we could make uh, decisions within foreign affairs uh, with a qualified majority and then if a country didn't want to be part of that they could make that made an out, uh, opt out for themselves uh, this was withdrawn and uh, we are now in the situation that we don't have a common foreign policy and that's really a pity because we could be a much more important force in the world if we, we if we manage to do to do that and uh, uh, I so much hope that we will have more federation here that we do this together and we can in many other uh, other issues do it and as one I think it's quite a famous saying don't be afraid you don't make an omelette by hard-boiled eggs <laughs> which you shouldn't fear that the national identity disappear. No, that's not our problem. The problem is the opposite. So, so I suppose that you're you're quite happy about the uh, the comments of the uh, of the German minister uh, uh, Eiko Maas uh, about getting rid of the of the veto on, on foreign policy. I, I suppose that you're quite yes, happy absolutely. about. Absolutely, and that has been my party's position also before we really changed the whole policy of the party. We were in favor of having a stronger foreign affairs. Uh, than we have now, and you know, doing Palestine. Imagine if we really if, if we, if, if, if we went together, and we had to live up to our own laws on on, on respecting international conventions and so on. You couldn't just sit there with human rights watch coming out telling that Israel is a true apartheid state in the occupied territory. There would be an outcry, as it was in uh, Myanmar, Tawasi uh, Rohingya, as it was in in China, uh, and mm -hmm. and so on. But now we're just sitting there and doing nothing. And I think you will see many more zero things happen if we could really vote and not just one single country could block a, a, a good step forward. And uh, of course, I have other uh, 
important issues to than uh, Palestine. But it's just so it's uh, visible here mm-hmm. that okay. we are paralyzed. All right. Uh, well, again, okay, looking at the time, uh, we're about around an hour. So what I would propose is that, uh, uh, Mrs. Oken, you, uh, I would like to give you the opportunity to say a final word to, to our audience before, well, you, you go yes. on and enjoy your day. Yes, okay. I did it just say to everybody, you know, a democracy is a burden. It is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a privilege, it's an hour, but it's also an obligation and a burden. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's... Uh, and all of us to do as much as we can to uh, to influence, to make sure that you have the possibility to just to do this here. Find where you find the real areas where that could be environment, climate, refugees. That could also be uh, social uh, social responsibility, social equality. That could be absolutely tax evasion, which is one of the other heavy problems we have. And engage as much as you can. Insist on having the possibility to do that in a, in a proper way. And remember that nobody can help everybody, but everybody can help somebody. That's a, a nice message. So uh, I would, before I start the debrief of the audience, I would like to, to thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Auken, for taking your time to answer our questions. So chat, make sure to, to, to thank her for, uh, for taking the time and be with us. Uh, don't forget to check her out on uh, uh, social media. You can see her Twitter handle be, uh, below the video feed. And yeah. on this, I, I wish you a good uh, a good evening and thanks again. I, I, I cannot promise you I'm answering everything that's happening in the social media because I have a life also outside social media. <laughs> oh, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry at all. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. All right. So, uh, that's it for this interview. Uh, let me take my notes. I mean, we... We have a nice background with flowers and birds. That was a, uh, that was nice. Uh, the, the sign was not perfect by when she was calling from uh, from Nipat. So I mean, it's uh, uh, that w- that's not exactly in my control uh, on this. But uh, I hope it was uh, still uh, enjoyable uh, uh, on your side. I also, I, I think you noticed at some point I lost the video feed. I don't know, uh, it's, uh, for some reason the Zoom call just got minimized, and then I had to struggle a bit to to to, to put it back. But. Uh, it, Hopefully they, uh, they didn't uh, screw up anything, uh, anything, the sound I think was working well. Anyway, so uh, let's start our, our little chat uh, to debrief the, uh, the overall interview. Uh, so it was, as usual, uh, interesting. Uh, uh, we touched upon a lot of issues. We talked a lot about uh, the, the Denmark. Uh, uh, and it's true that it was interesting because the Denmark uh, does have a, a very... Uh, I don't want to say special or peculiar, but uh, a unique relationship to, to, the, uh, to the EU because it's normally you imagine the Nordic countries uh, uh, as being very much pro-EU, etc. But Denmark has always been like uh, uh, quite cautious when it came to the EU. It was the, uh, the UK's best friend when it came to, uh, to taking opt-out and stuff like that. So it, it was interesting, especially to hear uh, that uh, herself and, and her party were actually quite... I don't want to say you're a skeptic, but uh, uh, not enthusiastic about, about the EU. So that's uh, uh, that, that's interesting to, to hear uh, that context and that uh, she changed the opinion uh, as time came, uh, came forward. So let's take uh, my little piece of paper with uh, with what I noted uh, in terms of, of things that uh, that I found interesting. I uh, was saying a fun peninsula of, of, of the EU. Yes, indeed. Um, Everyone can make mistakes. The important thing is to fix them, and, and it seems that they, that they did, yeah. Uh, but I mean, it would be interesting. E- Carlos, do you agree with her that uh, uh, skepticism about the EU is uh, far less uh, uh, pregnant than uh, that it used to be? Uh, that would be interesting to her to hear. Um, but in the meantime, so f- first thing I found that was interesting, uh, p- the point that she raised that was interesting is about the, when we were talking about the virus, uh, the COVID, and etc. She was still talking about the uh, the human impact. So the fact that part of the the fact that humanity uh, takes its toll on nature uh, favor uh, is favoring the the apparition of virus because and that's that's something that is actually scientifically true. Uh, the fact that by invading uh, I don't want to say nature's ecosystem but animals uh, ecosystem you force them to to go in 
uh, smaller areas and that favors the uh, actually uh, the interaction with other animals uh, with other uh, viruses and so it creates it, um, it favors the, uh, the emergence of, of viruses like the covid uh let's see guys what you what you're saying it has fallen a big amount here from peak 2014 it's kind of night and day so you give brexit most of the credit yeah i, I would agree with that uh, and this is Talia saying that Mark has turned quite a bit in favor of the EU over the past few years uh, and the last EU election really showed that. Uh, why do you say it was peak in, uh, in 2014? What, what makes it like so high in, in 2014? Uh, what, what, what was special uh, uh, for it to be so high? I mean, and then define high. Uh, what are we talking about in terms of number? Uh, ah, the migration crisis. Yeah, you're right, of course. <laughs> the migration crisis. It's always a migration crisis. Uh, yes, okay, yeah, it, make, it, make, it makes sense uh, then uh, that, of course, it, uh, it will have uh, had an impact uh, like it has uh, elsewhere in Europe. Um, you can think of, uh, of Italy, for, uh, for instance, in, the, in that sense. And the 2014 election map was super fun, right, because it was, yeah, topical, of course. All right, uh, interesting. And it was interesting also to, also to hear uh, the, the, how... Covid was indulged uh, at uh, in Denmark because I mean, uh, I mean yeah, as you know I'm, I'm in Belgium so it's uh, it's always interesting to hear about how things work in uh, in different uh, member states. But what she seemed to describe was seemed to be quite close to to what we had in uh, in Belgium. So I agreed uh, on the fact that the, it, it took it uh, the whole crisis, the confinement took its toll on on people, on the economy, and and all that. Um, yeah, that was an interesting question. Thanks, Blast, for for for, for one. I I don't know why I didn't think about it when I when I was drafting my uh, my own question about the uh, the spying scandal. Indeed, that uh, uh, Denmark spied on uh, on allies and notably Germany and uh, and France. Uh, uh, that that's indeed something that I should I should have thought about. So thanks uh, thanks for that. Uh, and she didn't seem surprised by that uh, since she said that uh, spying among friends is. Uh, is quite common. Uh, she, she was mentioning that apparently she, she worked quite a bit on uh, on um, security and uh, foreign affairs policy uh, back in the 80s, I think she said, or the 70s. Uh, so that she was not surprised that uh, there there was some spying uh, among friends, which is yeah, of course not uh, not surprising at all. Uh, even if yeah, the question is less about like that you spy on your friend because uh, let's be. Realistic, everyone spies on everyone, uh, that's part of the game, but that they were basically doing the job of the uh, of the US uh, in this, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's what makes it uh, interesting and a bit more hurtful. Um, question is, has it really stopped in 2014 or not? But saying it may be common doesn't mean uh, it's a good thing. No, it's true, it's true, it's true. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, in, in security policy it's always a, a, a bit of a, of a conundrum because uh, uh, yes, I like country, your neighbors are your friend, but do you trust your, fully trust your friends? I, I remember having uh, debates and discussion with people who work a lot on, on defense policy and they say, yeah, we are the problem in, uh, in saying that uh, you need to share information, etc. with other countries and it's, it's important. But the problem is that while some countries are highly uh, competent and reliable in uh, when it comes to security, uh, um, intelligence sharing and, uh, and those sort of things, other countries are terrible at it. Uh, and basically, if you give them information, is the best way to ensure that this information is going to leak elsewhere to countries that you don't want uh, them to know what you know. So that's uh, that makes it complete. That's why a lot of countries actually have uh, issues with sharing for intel widely in the EU because well, they don't trust everyone uh, because they think that if they uh, if they give the information, well, it's going to end up in Russia, in China, or elsewhere. So let's see the chat. Uh, you can explain a bit further the uh, the concept in uh, in Denmark. Uh, oh, so Denmark is now pulling majority in favor of abolishing the defense opt out. Is that changing? Uh, but it's still against intelligence and, uh, and euro opt in. Okay, interesting. And yeah, Vestager was the de facto prime minister in Denmark back then. Uh, uh, and so far, she has uh, dodged the questions on. Uh, 
on whether she knew about it. Uh, she said that it was not the remit of a of a ministry because she was ministry of her. Uh, I know the name in French, uh, ministry of internal affairs um, and economy, if I if I recall well. So that she she did not follow these things. But like you say, it was a she was a de facto prime minister. So did she know? Did she not know? That's uh, that's something we might never know. And so far, she's been dodging the bullets. Uh, but okay, uh, let's see uh, what else. Ah, oh, something she said that I thought was very interesting is when I said, "Oh, well, what made what changed you to a pro-European?" She said, "Oh, I'm not pro-European. I'm pro-influence." And uh, and she said several times that she. Uh, I don't. I don't remember if she said that on the stream or when we were chatting before the beginning of the stream. She, she said that she loved influence. Uh, so she loved having influence. Uh, and indeed, uh, she she has a very. Uh, that's a very pragmatic to approach to, uh, to to Europe uh, in the sense that it's. Uh, uh, it goes away from the whole sentiment. Oh yeah, I, I love the EU because I'm, uh, uh, because I love the idea of the project, etc. Et but it's a more pragmatic approach, saying, well, that's the best way to get what we want. Uh, it's the best way to stay relevant. And as she mentioned uh, from the, uh, the, the 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 speech from Chancellor Schmidt, uh, German Chancellor Schmidt, about the fact that in case of Germany in twenty in twenty fifty, it's going to be one percent maybe of the. Uh, 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 of the world population so to counteract that you need to be part of a bigger group uh, if you want to have a chance so this group being the EU in this uh, in this case so I I found that interesting that's something that you so you see uh, it, it doesn't surprise me to see that kind of justification of being pro EU that way in Denmark because like, like we we say, we discussed Denmark has been uh, skeptical about the EU to, to an extent, but that's also something you see, uh, for instance, in France. Uh, a lot of people say, uh, "Oh, I'm not pro EU. I, th I just think that the best, the EU is the best uh, vehicle for influence of, of influence for France." So they, they, uh, they, they said there's this old idea that uh, being uh, being French, being very much in favor of the of the French state, means also defending the EU because the EU is the best vehicle of power for, for France in the future because on our own we can't, we can't do much and uh, that's very much the line that uh, Michel Barnier has been taking uh, ever since he went back to uh, uh, to uh, to French politics he's defining himself as a, a patriot and European and so he says that to be patriot you, you uh, in, to, in today's world a patriot can a French patriot can only be pro-European because that's that's the only way for France uh, to, 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 to be relevant. Uh, so that's, uh, that's interesting, this all, uh, that's how also you balance this, uh, this idea of, uh, uh, of not putting the EU again in opposition uh, of your national identity, but as something complementary, the, the, uh, an extension of it. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's something that is uh, quite interesting. Uh, like I was saying, yeah, realistic and logical stance, aesthetically, yeah. But uh, yeah, no, it, it, it was interesting to, to hear that, especially from a green, uh, from a green, uh, and uh, perhaps a, a, I mean, she, she seemed to, to, to imply that quite a, quite a, quite a bit, so you can also help me on that. She, she seemed to mention that initially her party was not part of the green, and that she she uh, she actually helped the party switch to uh, to the green policy, and that they are on the left side they they were very much uh, uh, against the EU. Uh, so what's the story behind that? That I mean, what what was the party before before they became green? What what were they? They were socialists. They were something else. Uh, what's the story behind uh, behind that? That would, that would be interesting. Another thing that I noted that is interesting and that we've been talking also for, 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 for in a couple of interviews is the uh, the whole debate about the EU minimum wage and the fact that Nordic states are not so much in favor of it. Oh, you wouldn't be paying attention, Carlos. Well, you're gonna vo you're gonna watch the stream again and you're gonna pay attention. And I, I want a full report in uh, in Discord by tomorrow. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, or am I? But yeah, this uh, this all uh, fear in the Nordic countries that uh, EU minimal wage would actually weaken them, their own system, because uh, as she mentioned, their system relies on a high 
union participation and she said that in in, uh, in Denmark it was 70 80 percent and well, in other countries it was not the case I know in France it's closer to 10 percent something like that union participation uh so it's uh it's in very different uh, uh, structures and it makes sense that uh, the, the they're not very keen on that, and that's something that beyond this debate you see quite often in many different things. Uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the Nordic countries often have something a very specific system that do not have equivalent elsewhere in Europe, and you hear a lot in, when you're talking about uh, uh, whatever legislation. You will have someone say, "Oh well, but what about the Nordics?" <laughs> and so you have to create mechanism to make sure that the Nordic could keep their system in parallel of the. Uh, of everything. Uh, somebody is going to fail the MEP assistant exam. <laughs> exactly. I, I'm not going to say uh, what is the sanction for, for failing, but there will be sanctions. So you better pass. But yeah, that, that's interesting to, to see also this uh, this Nordic uh, uniqueness uh, to, that exists in a, in a lot of EU uh, policies. Uh, then what else did we uh, did we discuss? Uh, uh, she talked about transparency a lot. Uh, that's uh, Ikara saying you're surprised how widely positive the feather is to answer. Uh, oh. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because especially since you promised me that she was going to be against it. So uh, when you said, "Oh no, I'm totally in favor," I was like, "Oh, I was lied to." <laughs> Ikara was lied to me. Uh, but yeah, then again, I was when you told when you told me that she was like, that she would be against uh, EU federation. I was actually surprised because well, as Greens, Greens tend to be uh, uh, oh, tends to be they are completely in favor of a uh, of a federal EU. But I uh, I don't know if that's something that is like only specific to her or if it's the party position uh, to be in, into uh, EU federation. Even if I mean being the party position is something that is. Relative because uh, sometimes they they don't say it very loud. Uh, they say it very loud in Brussels, but they don't say it very loud uh, uh, back in the capital. And uh, I think it depends a lot on how the federal state would be structured. I agree. Uh, it's mainly positive in terms of foreign affairs. Uh, yeah, I, I I I agree with you to an extent, uh, Talias, because I agree that it depends a lot about how. Uh, federation state would be structured and that's part of the reason on my side I uh, uh, I'm not I'm skeptic I have my doubts about the, the f whether federal union would be feasible because of the of the structure uh, mainly positive on in terms of foreign affairs again uh, skeptical on that uh, of course it's problematic when you have one country that is uh, uh, blocking important initiati initiatives in foreign affairs. So we've seen the, uh, we've seen lately uh, Hungary that has been blocking a lot of uh, of uh, uh, common EU position on China, on Russia, etc. Uh, so I see a problem with that. But at the same time, how do you define a common foreign policy for 27 uh, member states that all have different priorities? I mean. Uh, the priorities of Poland are obviously not the same as the priority of France, in my case. Uh, we care about what's happening in the Middle East, Poland cares about what happens in, in Russia. And what about the neutral state? I mean, uh, the Nordic countries, countries like uh, Austria or even Germany to an extent, uh, they're quite pacifist. Uh, why on the country, not on the country, but uh, uh, if you take countries like France, we have a strong military and we have more hands-on approach. So. How do we do you reconcile that? Uh, so that's that's again something that sounds nice, but is it doable, practical? I don't know. And there's also like a, a question of uh, of legitimacy because I mean, whether we like it or not, uh, member states have their priorities and they have reasons to have priorities because of their history, because of their own interests, etc., etc. So. Going over the, the interest of one country, the, what could be seen as a vital interest of one country uh, on something as important as foreign policy, uh, especially if we are talking about giving up power to the EU in terms of foreign policy, that's 
that's an entire debate. I mean, uh, would you, for instance, would you ignore what Cyprus is saying? Although Cyprus and Greece are saying about Turkey when you are talking about Turkey, uh, EU-Turkey relations. They are the neighbors, uh, so they, they, they have a big interest in that. And historically speaking, they have their, their problem with the Turkish, but they are small countries, so you could say, oh, well, you're not the majority, so get along with it. But is it legitimate? Uh, likewise for the Nordic countries, uh, uh, if the the uh, I'm not sure they would be very keen on being embarked in a in a uh, quite strong uh, uh, foreign policy uh, uh, decisions or even into military operations. Uh, how how do you deal with that? Is it legitimate to impose that on them? So that's I see the benefits, but it's a question of practicality. And I can understand. I mean, I mentioned it already quite a few uh, a few times in previous uh, in previous uh, streams. Uh, it's there is a legitimate debate. It's a uh, being a the, the, the fact that member states are reluctant to that. It's not something that you could put under the rug and say, "Oh, the member states are just being crazy." Uh, that's democratically speaking, there is something to be uh, to be discussed. But well, uh, anyway, I've been rambling on that. Uh, I've been rambling on that for several streams about that, so you know my, you know how I, I approach that. Anyway, let, let's talk about things that uh, we have not yet discussed. Uh, some another thing that she, she she mentioned that that was interesting is the uh, the rise of nationalism uh, across the 15 years she's been uh, in in parliament, and that's indeed something that has uh, that has uh, influenced the way the EU works. Uh, because we have seen, uh, just in the, par in the European Parliament, uh, political groups that have been very much very pro-EU, that are still pro-EU to, to a good extent, uh, but being influenced by, uh, without going into nationalism, but more, uh, uh, how could I say this? Um, I don't want to say nationalism because nationalism is a, it's a different thing. It's more about the, the more cautious, uh, conservative about how things are, should work at EU level. Uh, so of course I'm thinking about the about the EPP uh, uh, in this, but but not only. I mean the uh, even the ECR. The ECR has been historically quite uh, Eurosceptic. That's uh, that's kind of their thing. Uh, I mean. Historically, they're, they're not that old a group, but still, it's been their thing to be a bit Eurosceptic. But at the same time, they were not nationalists like we are now seeing in the ECR. So it's a, it does affect the way things work, because uh, even if they had their uh, Euroscepticism, ECR was seen as like a serious group, something you could, uh, a group people you could work on. So you would even see, you would see Greens uh, being able to to find deals with this, this ECR, uh, and not in the way that it was too complicated, except if we, you were talking about EU integration. But uh, uh, today it's a much more complicated, uh, not only in this year, in part of the EPP, even if that's a bit less true now that uh, Hungary has left the uh, has left the building, so to say. Uh, but uh, Things have changed, and uh, uh, it may made things a bit more complicated to to next day, which is a paradox because uh, uh, at the same time the EU and the Parliament has become much more powerful uh, with a lot more things that it can do. So uh, sometimes you're like, oh well, if we had uh, if we had the Parliament that of 15 years ago, uh, this decision would have passed, no uh, no problem. Uh, but uh, we have to make do. Uh, and yeah, well, actually, I, uh, I had noticed the, the, noticed the question on EU federation and the common EU foreign policy, but I already ramble about that, so uh, that's covered. Uh, on your side, is there anything that I missed? Uh, I'd like to discuss. Uh, let's see. Uh, no, I don't see anything new. So. I will switch slowly. Uh, oh, pluralism is a real value, totally legitimate and orderly. Yeah, we agree on that. I think we all agree. Um, so yeah, let's go into the conclusion uh, a bit. So I hope you you enjoyed the interview, uh, despite the the small technical problems. Uh, but well, that's 
that's the life of a streamer. Uh, I'm not going to teach you anything about that. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. It was interesting. Um, next week is going to be a bit intense, but frustrating for, uh, for, quite, uh, for quite a few of you. Uh, because we will go south and we'll speak French. Uh, because first we will have an interview with French MEP Karim Adeli, so Green MEP, on Tuesday. And we will have a second uh, interview on Friday, uh, again in French, with Belgium MEP Maria Arena. And it's interesting because the second interview will not be a profile interview like we've the, we, we did until now, like we did today and with all the other MPs. Because this interview will be about China because uh, Maria Arena is actually the chair of the, uh, the subcommittee on human rights in the European Parliament. And it happens that this committee has been formally sanctioned by China in retaliation of the, uh, the sanctions that the EU take, uh, has taken uh, uh, for human rights concerns. So uh, we will actually discuss about what it, mean, what, what it means for a committee and for herself uh, to, to to be subject to this sanction from China uh, and also about what's happening in China. So it will be a more topical interview. Uh, I still need to confirm the exact times for, for both uh, for both interviews, but it will be on uh, it basically will be on Tuesday evening and on Friday end of afternoon, probably six, six o'clock. But I will I will keep you informed uh, as usual. Uh, Black is saying that French is going to be a working language of the EU, so you better start learning. Exactly, so he can get learning uh, to fr get to French. Uh, it's for your own good. So anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed tonight uh, tonight content. Uh, as always, so thanks for the for, for the new follower. Uh, don't hesitate to follow me here on Twitter or on Discord. It helps the channel a lot. Uh, all the links are uh, in the bio so on this note i thank you all again for being here tonight uh and i wish you a good a good evening and a good weekend and i will see you sometime next week bye everyone